Hello and welcome to Lore of the Cards, the series that looks to find the lore hidden in your Hearthstone deck. Since Lillian Voss was one of the cards most requested when I first started covering Knights of the Frozen Throne, it only makes sense to cover her now. Plus, I'd written this episode before the release of Cobolds and Catacombs, so you're damn right I'm finishing it. The art of the card is by Gonzalo Ordonez, a part of the Canadian Udon Crew art group who are responsible for the Overwatch art. Genzo Man, as he is also known, is perhaps best known for his work on the Street Fighter series of games, but is frequently commissioned by some of the largest and best known game franchises in the world. For Hearthstone, he's produced a couple of adventure bosses and an adventure card, a handful of uncollectible cards, three commons, one rare, three epic, and of course, the legendary Lilium Voss. Lillian was the daughter of High Priest Benedictus Voss, a member of rank among the Scarlet Crusade. The Crusade was one of the two orders to evolve from the Knights of the Silver Hand as they desperately fought to save the Kingdom of Lordaeron from the Undead Scourge. A rift formed in the Silver Hand, Lordaeron's Paladins, after the death of one of their champions, High Lord Alexandrus Mograine. It was to be believed that Mograine had fallen to an overwhelming undead force, a devastating loss to the order as Mograine was the wielder of the Ashbringer, a weapon capable of turning the undead to ash, its power fueled by the holy disc attached to the back of the blade. In actuality, Alexandrus had been betrayed by his own son, Renault the boy succumbing to the manipulation of the dreadlord Balnazar, who had possessed one of the highest ranking members of the Silver Hand, Satan Dathrahan. Renault thought that after his father had fought off the legion of undead he had led them to, they were alone. The sun drove the Ashbringer through Alexandrus's chest, leaving his body and the now corrupted Ashbringer to rot. What he did not notice was that High Inquisitor Fairbanks remained alive. The good friend of Alexandrus was assumed to have died early on in their tussle with the undead. He had in fact become buried in the corpses of the undead slain by his friend. Fairbanks burst into a meeting of the Silver Hand, spitting curses and near foaming at the mouth with rage for what Renault had done to his father. Remaining calm, Balnazar accused Fairbanks of being tainted by the undead and now infected by the plague of undeath. He commanded Fairbanks be taken away and executed. Some, such as Lord Maxwell Tyrosus, suspected that Fairbanks' ravings may have an element of, or be completely true. They would break away from the Silver Hand to form the Argent Dawn, while those that remained would call themselves the Scarlet Crusade. Both groups committed to eradicating the Undead Scourge from the lands of Lordaeron. What time Lillian was born isn't totally clear, though I would assume her birth occurred close to the split in the Silver Hand, as she was raised very much in keeping with the values of the Scarlet Crusade. High Priest Voss raised Lillian to battle the Plague of Undeath, Lillian's childhood being given up to fight the undead. She was moulded into a weapon against the plague. Lillian studied stealth, sorcery, martial arts and anything that would transform her into a more effective weapon against the undead. Perhaps Lillian took too much on in order to please her father. Perhaps she had not been studying long enough. Either way, she would be killed. How is unknown, and her corpse would end up in the graveyard of Death Knell, the location where many new members of the Forsaken began their new lives. As time progressed, the Scarlet Crusade became weaker and weaker, with demonic leadership, Malganis, also infiltrating the Crusade and grasping a position of power, the Crusade didn't exactly get on with Azeroth's two major factions, the Alliance and Horde. The Scarlet Crusade very much believed that all undead were bad undead, a position that didn't endear them to the Horde, the Forsaken joining their ranks just before the events of the first World of Warcraft game. The Forsaken were different to the Scourge, as they had broken away from them. They were no longer bound to the will of the Lich King, 
they each had free will. So whether evil or righteous, it was up to the individual to decide, not that of the dominating and definitely evil Lich King. While their occurrence was unnatural and their flesh partially rotted, the Forsaken were a people that had been given a second opportunity at life, which had been snatched away from them too early by the Scourge. The Scarlet Crusade believed all undead were abominations and sought to eradicate them, entering into hostilities with the Forsaken, which, due to the Forsaken's Horde support, the Crusade would often come out worse off from. While the Crusade made no direct, sustained attacks on member races of the Alliance, they too had no qualms with cutting down Crusade members if they stood in their way. Perhaps this was due to the actions of the Crusade ultimately being driven by evil demons, or their clear racism. The later Scarlet Crusade members of the Silver Hand did not believe in letting other races join their order, viewing them as lesser in comparison to humanity. The Argent Dawn, however, enjoyed a good relationship with the Alliance and Horde. Not influenced by demons, they kept their membership open to all races, even to the Forsaken. As long as each member was willing to combat the evil of the Scourge, there was a place for them in the Argent Dawn. Despite having no real allies, the Crusade at least had the Scarlet Enclave, a bastion close to the Eastern Plaguelands. While the lands surrounding the Enclave were befouled, it stood unblemished. However, at the start of the Wrath of the Lich King expansion, the Lich King himself, along with Death Knights of the Scourge, descended upon the Enclave. With no allies to call upon, the Scourge enveloped the Scarlet Crusade's bastion. To make matters worse, Crusade members from areas near the Enclave were arriving to join their brothers and sisters as they headed to Northrun to battle the Lich King. While many did arrive in Northrun, now calling themselves the Scarlet Onslaught, Slot, most of the Crusade members that had journeyed to the Enclave were obliterated. In Northrun, the Onslaught not only crossed blades with the Scourge, but also the Forsaken and the Ebon Blade. The latter were Death Knights that had broken from the Lich King's control and were now allied with the Alliance and Horde. As the Crusade were now attacking a mutual ally of the two factions, since the Death Knights were undead, this further increased the Alliance and Horde's animosity towards them. In the wake of the Northrun campaign, the Scarlet Crusade had been gutted. Balnazar and Malganis had been exposed, the upper echelon of the Crusade was totally destroyed, and their base in Hearthglen had been reclaimed by Tyrion Fordring and his relatively newly formed faction, the Argent Crusade. About the only thing that had gone right for the Crusade was the death of Lich King Arthas. However, even in this they had had no hand and if anything had hindered the efforts of the Alliance and Horde. Around the time of the Cataclysm, the Crusade only really had a presence in Tirisfor Glades. The Scarlet Monastery remaining in their control and a new outpost, the Scarlet Palisade, being established. While the Crusade had fallen upon very hard times, things were only going to get worse. After the Lich King's defeat, many of the Valkyr found themselves in need of employment. Rather than be hunted down, they pledged their loyalty to Sylvanas and the Forsaken. The Valkyr were capable of raising bodies into undeath. Many Forsaken relished the chance to attack the Lich King in Northrend, as he had taken away the existence they once enjoyed. While the Forsaken did achieve their vengeance upon the King, many of them lost their lives. With no way to reproduce, their numbers were greatly diminished. Sylvanas saw in the Valkyr a resolution to this problem. The Valkyr Agatha, Arthura and Aradon were stationed at the Death Knell graveyard to raise undead for the Forsaken on an unprecedented scale. Sylvanas separated herself from the Lich King in a key way, allowing all Forsaken Risen their free will. If they did not want to join her ranks, so be it. One of the new Forsaken Risen by Agatha took their resurrection extremely well. Their mind remained whole, they were willing to serve Sylvanas, and they still had all their body parts attached. Not all 
were as fortunate as this adventurer, and their first tasks were focused on helping their forsaken brothers and sisters. They were sent into the Shadow Grave to gather embalming fluid and thread so that those born without limbs could have other limbs sewn onto them by Undertaker Mordo. Sometimes missing limbs were not the issue. Not all undead dealt with the sudden shock of being returned to life by the Valkyr well. Some chose to end their life straight away and others became shambling zombies, which would be dealt with by members of the Forsaken that kept their sanity. Others were more complex than this, and Caretaker Case sent the new Forsaken adventurer to speak with three of them. One was Valdred Moray. He had met a gruesome end, bleeding out after an orc severed both his hands. In life, he was friends with Raleigh Andrian and his wife, Delia. Raleigh would be killed by the Scourge and would later become Forsaken. Delia would be murdered by Moray. It would appear he killed her before she became an undead. To avenge his wife, it was Raleigh who hired the Orc to kill Valdred. The Orc found him outside the Grey Main Wall just before Gilneas, Valdred stubbornly waiting to be let in. Needless to say, he never was. When looking down at his hands, the Forsaken Valdred began to panic. They were not his hands. The Forsaken hero was able to calm Moray. He would accept his fate and report to Mordo to begin his life in service of Sylvanas. Marcus Redpath was another the Forsaken adventurer approached. In life, Marcus was a marshal of the Alliance. Prior to the second war between orcs and humans, Marcus, the headman of South Shore, would be among the first to welcome the people of Stormwind, led by Anduin Lothar, to the Kingdom of Lordaeron. This was after Stormwind's crushing defeat in the First War. Redpath would survive both the Second and Third Third War, remaining stationed at South Shore in the contested territory of the Hillsborough foothills. There, he sought to rid the town of various threats, Murlocs, Crush Ridge Ogres, and Naga. Redpath would also investigate the murder of Eric Folrook, but each person accused had an alibi. In the end, it was not Redpath who brought Eric's killer, his own brother Cedric, to justice. Redpath's life was ended when the Forsaken bombed his home of South Shore with their plague of undeath. Redpath was not as receptive as Moray and ran off, claiming he would form his own group. He would later lead the Rot Brain undead, formulating a scheme to attack Death Knell, but would be stopped by the Forsaken before this attack could be launched. The final Forsaken the hero spoke to was one that looked like she may have been a young woman in life, cowering by two trees as zombies and Forsaken passed her by. It was Lillian Voss. As the Forsaken drew closer to Voss, she seemed to cower even more, yelling at the approaching hero to stay away from her and that they were an abomination. The hero sought to calm the clearly fearful Voss, telling her they were no abomination, just an undead that wished to speak with her. Clearly oblivious to her current state, Voss railed at the Forsaken. She told them that the undead were a taint upon the world of Azeroth and they all deserved to be destroyed. Seeing that Voss did not have a grip on her situation, the Forsaken hero asked her whether she realised that she too was an undead. Lillian snapped back. No, you're lying. My father will protect me. Before the hero could reply, she darted toward the small village of Death Knell. The hero continued to aid their brethren, disposing of uncontrollable undead and cleaning away the bodies of those in the Scarlet Crusade who attacked the Forsaken. It would not be long before their path crossed once again with Lillian Voss's. Clearly worried about Voss's mental state, the Forsaken novice Elreth wanted the hero to help Voss. Not long ago, she had seen Voss run into town, deliriously screaming, pleading to be taken back home and running into the Inn of Death Knell. Novice Elreth told the adventurer that while some undead struggled with it, 
they must accept their fate. Only then could they rise up against those that sought to put them down. She requested the hero take her hand mirror to Voss, show her what she now truly was, and hope that Voss would then join the Forsaken. The Forsaken adventurer would find Voss cowering yet again, hiding away in the far corner of the inn. When they approached, they were met with another icy response. Get away from me, you monster! Don't look at me, I'm hideous! Lillian was told she was not hideous, that she was forsaken. The hero was clearly trying to make Voss feel as though she were part of a group that would not shun her for what she now was. When presented with her reflection, Lillian did not calm down. The other Forsaken did not understand. She could not be undead. Not now. With that, she fled up the inn stairs, hiding away in one of the bedrooms, telling any who tried to speak to her to get away from her. Upon leaving Death Knell, it would not be long before the hero became aware of why Lillian so feared what she had become. Reporting to the Calston farmstead, the hero was sent to kill farmers of the Solidin farmstead by Death Guard Simmer. The Death Guard did not trust the humans who he thought were fickle in nature. Soon, they would grab their pitchforks and march upon the Forsaken. This was a defensive measure, dealing with the humans before they rose up against the Forsaken. These were not the only humans in the area. Just beyond the farmstead was the Scarlet Palisade, one of the Crusade's few remaining outposts. After the farmers, Simmer wanted to send more of the Forsaken's hated enemy to their graves. The hero charged through the palisade with reckless abandon, slaughtering any Scarlet Warriors that dared stand against them. During the slaughter, the Forsaken found a letter upon the corpse of one of their slain foes. Unraveling the Scarlet letter, it read, Lieutenant Gebler, how curious that you would decide to take a prisoner, an undead one at that. What were you thinking? Do you think that just because of this prisoner's former status that she should be above the Edicts of the Scarlet Crusade? This is most troubling, Gebler. I would remind you there are penalties for such behaviour. I command you to execute the prisoner at once. She is no longer one of us. Their interest peaked. The hero went searching for this prisoner. Heading toward the Palisades Watchtower, cutting down any crusader that crossed them, the adventurer made their way to the top of the building. Overlooking the Palisade locked within a cage was Lillian Voss. Surprised to see the hero, Voss tried to shoo them away, but they told her they were here to save her. Voss's reply was instant. She didn't need saving, and even if she did, there was no way that she would allow an undead to be her rescuer. Becoming slightly exasperated by Lillian's coldness, the Forsaken yet again told her they were the same. But as they said this, they came to a realisation. The Scarlet Crusade utterly despised all undead and killed them on sight. So why was Lillian still alive? Angered again by the Forsaken's insistence that they were the same, Lillian said she was not undead. If she were, she would not be for long. Her father would save her. Before the adventurer could find out who her father was, a figure appeared, climbing the stairs of the watchtower. Ignoring the Forsaken, he made his way toward Lillian and announced that word had come back from Lillian's father. Gebler, you came. What did he say? Lillian responded. Of course, having read the letter addressed to Gebler, the Forsaken knew of Lillian's father's decision. Gebler continued, High Priest Voss denounces you as his daughter. He's ordered that you be executed immediately. It became clear why Lillian had rejected her fate as one of the Forsaken. She had been terrified about losing her friends, everything she had once stood for, and her father. As Gebler continued saying how her fate was a shame, that her father had had high hopes for Lillian's potential against their enemies, Lillian cried out in anguish. It couldn't be. Rejected by her father and now to be executed by a man she had once called her friend. Gebler continued to twist a knife. 
As Voss was so dangerous in life, she would remain dangerous in death. He was very much looking forward to decapitating the Scourge Witch. With that final comment, Lillian saw red. Roaring, her body became consumed by purple fire. Like a spectre, she leapt through the bars of her cage, landing on Gedler's two shoulders and tore at his face with her bare hands. When she was done, only a purple smouldering corpse remained. Still stunned by her father and friend's betrayal, Lillian told herself that the living may have turned their back on her, but she was no member of the Scourge. Not even turning to face the adventurer, she told them to just go. Death Guard Simmer found Voss interesting when told about what had happened. He was intrigued as to why Voss had been taken prisoner rather than killed. The Crusade hadn't ever hesitated to kill a turned fellow before. More intriguing was Voss's ability to pass through a solid object, and Simmer wondered why she had not done that sooner. What Voss had resolved to do would be revealed to the hero when they were sent to aid the Forsaken stationed at the town of Brill. In the Third War, Brill was one of the first towns to be affected by the Plague of Undeath. The necromancer Kel'Thuzad began his experiments with the plague in this town. Acting on the information received from Death Knell, Executor Zygan was able to take action to rid even more of the living from the lands of the Forsaken. He directed the hero to the ruined watchtower southwest of Brill, where members of the Scarlet Crusade, led by Captain Perrin, had taken up residence. Naturally, the Forsaken adventurer's job was to murder Captain Perrin and as many Crusade soldiers as possible. While on their murderous rampage, the Forsaken was also told by the Executor to find any information hinting as to what the Scarlet Crusade were up to. Being the fine adventurer they were, that information was found. An urgent memorandum from Archbishop Voss. An urgent message to all Scarlet officers and enlistees. The Scourge agent known as Lillian Voss has escaped from her captivity at the Scarlet Palisade. She is to be considered highly dangerous and should be killed on sight. She has already slain 15 of our men. None were left wounded. Do not try to apprehend her. Doing so will likely result in death. She is an enemy to the Crusade and must be crushed immediately. The Crusader who returns her head to the High Priest will be rewarded with 1,000 gold. Refer any questions to your commanding officer. Voss had clearly decided to take revenge upon those who had rejected her. The 15 were only the beginning beginning of the corpses left in her wake. During another mission, killing members of the Crusade stationed at a ruined tower near the Balnir farmstead from which they launched raids against the Forsaken, the adventurer couldn't help but notice the burning bodies that were scattered among their ranks. High Executor Darrington, who had sent them on this mission, would explain upon their return. He said that not long before the Forsaken Hero's arrival, a young undead woman had approached him, swearing enmity against the Scarlet Crusade. Happy to make use of what seemed to be a powerful recruit, the Executor sent her against the camp of Crusaders to the north in Venomweb Vale. It appears this woman may have wandered somewhat and killed a few crusaders at the tower too. Darrington suggested the hero go and see how she was doing and lend her aid if she needed it, though he suspected the crusaders may already be dead. Cutting a path through the giant black spiders of the Vale, the hero made their way to the camp. What greeted them was a vision of devastation. A host of crusader bodies lay around the camp, not a single one left alive, all blazing with purple flame. Noticing that just one body was not set ablaze and instead had been hung upside down from a tree, the hero moved closer to inspect it. As they looked at the corpse of Lieutenant Sanders, who led these crusaders, the Forsaken heard a cold whisper in their ear. I could kill you right now if I wanted to. You better watch your step undead. Not yet revealing her location, Lillian Voss told the adventurer her story, how her childhood had been given up in order to pursue a life of dedication to her father and to the Crusade. Since becoming undead, she had been rejected and her execution ordered by those she had once loved and trusted. She told the hero to come with her, as she wished 
to speak with her father, stationed just to the north in a tower northwest of the Scarlet Monastery. Naturally, members of the Crusade sought to stop Foss's ascent to the tower. While ably assisted by the hero, their strength paled when compared to Voss's. She was able to use her dark powers to drag multiple foes toward her and dispatch each of them quickly, jumping on top of them, clawing at their faces and near instantly reducing them to a burning corpse. She charged into the tower to confront her father. High Priest Voss was flanked by a bodyguard and a captain among the ranks of the Crusade. Melrish. Despite his protection, the High Priest was noticeably shaken by Lillian's arrival. Trying to speak pleasantly with his daughter and stumbling over his words before being told to shut up. Lillian swiftly murdered the High Priest's protection and mockingly asked her father, You raised me to be a killer. How am I doing, Daddy? Lillian continued to mock her father. He told her to kill the undead, so surely she should kill herself now. With a yell, her flames intensifying, Lillian concluded, why kill herself when she could kill her father? Leaping at her father, he was dispatched just as easily as all of Voss's other victims. She then ran away, not to be seen for some time. At a time when most of the Alliance and Horde's efforts were focused upon the continent of Pandaria, some heroes decided to assault the Scarlet Monastery. After Lillian Voss's devastating attack greatly reduced their ranks, the monastery remained as the Scarlet Crusade's last outpost. If defeated here, it was doubtful they would ever recover. The monastery was split into two separate sections, and the heroes began their quest within the Scarlet Halls. Before their mission could even begin, they were greeted by what appeared to be a hooded member of the Crusade. The hooded crusader greeted the adventurers, assuring them she didn't mean them any harm. She went on to explain she was only posing as one of the crusaders, as she felt the order had become irredeemably corrupt. She wanted to put an end to them, once and for all, and she had steps to follow in order to achieve this. The first step was perhaps obvious. She asked the party to kill as many of the Scarlet Crusaders as possible. Fewer numbers meant a weaker order. More importantly, she wanted the adventurers to take the Codex of the Crusade from Flameweaver Coegla. The Hooded Crusader had tried on multiple occasions to get close to Coegla, but it had never worked out. She told the party to be careful, as she had heard the Flameweaver had gone completely mad. Coegla, who trained magic casters of the Crusade, had been driven insane by the Crusade's past failures being the pawns of demons. As a result, he sought to burn all the books in the monastery's library, trying to erase all records of the Crusade's shameful past. The Hooded Crusader's warning about Coegla was sage. His flames have reduced undead, trespassers, and even students to nothing more than ash. The hero's raid of the Scarlet Halls was successful a host of Scarlet Crusaders falling before their blades, including the Flame Weaver himself. The Hooded Crusader had followed in their wake, pleased by the devastation wrought by the adventurers among the ranks of the Crusade. As the heroes handed the Hooded Crusader the Codex, she rubbed her hands together with glee. This book contained a list of all members of the Scarlet Crusade. That way, if any members were unaccounted for after the raid upon the monastery, the Hooded Crusader could hunt down those that escaped retribution and tie up any loose ends. Ensuring that even after destroying their main bastion, the Scarlet Crusade would have no place to hide, the Hooded Crusader led the heroes to the main body of the Scarlet Monastery, which contained the graveyard and the cathedral. Upon arrival, the graveyard appeared to be in chaos, crusaders running to piles of bodies, setting them alight with flamethrowers, while also dodging the attacks of the zombies that rose from these piles and the graves. This was all due to Thalnos, the Soul Render. Once revered among the Crusade, Thalnos was known for his brutal torture methods that would 
purify new recruits of the Order. The sadistic mage would somehow contract the plague of undeath and later rise in the monastery's graveyard to sow the seeds of anarchy, zombies and apparitions bending to his will. While Thalnos was a thorn in the side of the Crusade, they had managed to isolate him, keeping the cathedral safe. The Hooded Crusader was not concerned with Thalnos, but behind the Skeletal Mage was an object she did desire, one of the Blades of the Anointed. The Hooded Crusader explained to her companions that as an organisation, the Scarlet Crusade were relentless. Not even death stopped them for long, as they would be resurrected. The woman behind these resurrections was the High Inquisitor, Sally Whitemane. Despite being defeated before, Whitemane herself did not stay dead. The only way to ensure her death was permanent was to drive the two blades of the anointed through her corpse, unquenchable and the hand of providence. The Hooded Crusaders described them as swords of legend, each with a lost but storied history. Luckily, both these blades lay within the monastery grounds. The heroes defeated Thalnos to claim the first blade and then ventured deeper within the monastery to find the other. The second was in the chapel garden, standing before a statue in a water feature at the garden centre. Navigating their way through the gardens, the heroes came to the cathedral's entrance, guarded by Brother Korloff. The Scarlet Monk had learnt his abilities from Pandaren ambassadors as they travelled the lands of Azeroth. When showing his deadly martial prowess to his superiors, Koloff was immediately instructed to tutor more in the techniques he had learnt. Upon Koloff's death, the adventurers gained access to the cathedral. At the cathedral's end was Commander Durand, White Mane's champion. Durand fell before the heroes, but a powerful spell incapacitated them. White Mane revealed herself, and while the heroes were unable to act, resurrected her champion to assault them once again. Overcoming the odds, the group were able to defeat both Durand and White Mane. Drawing the swords of the anointed, they plunged them deep into the still body of White Mane. With this, the Hooded Crusader arrived and revealed to the heroes her true identity. She was Lillian Voss. She removed the blaze from White Mane's corpse, closing her hands around the sword's grips. Lillian felt as if they were made for her. The blade's appearance had also notably changed. After tasting the High Inquisitor's blood, the blade had morphed from long silver blades to blackened short swords, etched with purple runes. With swords that felt meant for her, Voss was ready for her next objective. Bowing her thanks to the heroes, Voss proclaimed that without White Mane, the Scarlet Crusade were finished. All that was left now was to sweep away the refuse. Saying goodbye to the heroes, for now, she told them she would be heading to Scholomance to deal with Dark Master Gandling. He was the current head teacher of the School of Necromancy, founded by Kel'Thuzad nearly ten years ago. For as much as Lillian hated the Scarlet Crusade for rejecting her, she still hated the Scourge with a passion. And after Lich King Arthas' defeat, Scholomance remained one of the few places infested by the evil undead and those that controlled them. As Voss's vendetta was against the Scourge, heroes would follow her to Scholomance, also eager to deal a blow to what remained of the forces that nearly brought the lands of the Eastern Kingdoms to their knees. Upon entry, it seemed Voss had not yet arrived at the school. Two skeletal guards standing outside the school's library and no commotion coming from within. They would fight their way through the school, defeating the introduction to the Dark Arts tutor, Instructor Chilhart, and the illusion Jandis Barov, daughter of Alexei Barov, who was the Lord of Caer Darrow, Brill, Taramil, and Southshore before being killed and turned into an agent of the Scourge. When entering Scholomance's Chamber of Suffering, the heroes were met with a hectic scene. Dark Master Gandling floated high above the ground, encircled by a shield of bone, while around the room's edge, summoners brought life to skeletons, sending the skeletal constructs towards the room's centre. In the middle of it all, was Lillian Voss, smashing the skeletons that attacked her. At Voss's urging, the heroes sprang into action, 
killing each of the summoners and stemming the skeletal tide. Gandling fled, and after a very short moment to catch her breath, Voss leapt into pursuit, unaware of what would transpire in her absence. The souls of the summoners gathered round the collapsed bones at the centre of the Chamber of Suffering. Their rotation around the bones quickening, the souls kicked up a whirlwind, drawing in bone from all around the chamber. Eventually, the magical wind dispersed, leaving the bone golem Rattlegore towering over the heroes. The party would defeat this imposing monster and fight their way through the Butcher's Sanctum, flesh horrors and carvers in their way. They would confront Gandling again, the necromancer using his magic to restrain Lillian. Noticing the heroes enter the room, Gandling mocked Lillian. Did you forget, girl? I am the Dark Master. I command the undead. Despite her resistance, Lillian was unable to resist Gandling's mastery of the necromantic arts. She was forced to attack the heroes that had aided her. Even as she swung her blades at the champions, she resisted Gandling's manipulation. However, with Gandling attacking her mentally and the heroes weakening her physical body, it was only a matter of time before Gandling's intent for Voss was realised. Announcing it was time for Lillian's transformation, Gandling tore her soul from her body. As Lillian's mortal shell fell to the floor, her blazing soul advanced upon the adventurers. Voss's soul blazed with hatred so fiercely it burnt any that were close to it. The spirit focused on an adventurer who, if she caught them, would feel this hatred burn with even more intensity. The heroes played to this, having the member of the group that Voss's soul was focused on run away, while other heroes sought to bring it down. This tactic paid off. But Gandling was not going to let his creation fall so easily. Figuring leaving Lillian's corpse on the ground was only a waste, the necromancer raised it, and it too attacked the heroes. Lillian's soul was defeated, but rather than move on to the next life, it lingered. Gandling was intrigued by this development, noticing her soul refused to relinquish its grasp on the world. This intrigue did not last long, Gandling seeing it as another opportunity to mock Lillian. How does it feel, Voss? to watch them hack your mortal body to pieces. The Dark Master would come to regret those words, as when Lillian's body was defeated, she did not fall. Her soul and body combined once again. Using the last of her strength, she attacked Gandling, causing the necromancer to flee into his inner sanctum. As heroes rushed to aid her, Voss told them, Leave me to die alone. Please. Listening to Voss, the heroes left her, found Gandling, and killed him. Heroes would later find that Lillian survived her near-death experience in Scholomance during their trip back to an alternative timeline Draenor, homeworld of the Orcs. This was a necessity, as the disgraced former Warchief of the Horde, Garrosh Hellscream, had travelled here to attack the Azeroth that had rejected him with the might of the Iron Horde. To fight this force, Heroes of Azeroth would establish garrisons upon Draenor to run their campaigns from. Buildings constructed within the garrison would aid them as they travelled the Orcish lands. One building that could be created was the Lunafall Inn for Alliance heroes and the Frostwall Tavern for Adventurers of the Horde. This inn attracted people of note to a hero's garrison, and they would give quests to perform within the dungeons of Draenor. One of those attracted to the inn was Lillian Voss. She had been drawn to Draenor due to the necromantic activity being used by the Orcs loyal to the Burning Legion. A hot spot for this activity was within the Orchindun. This was the holy mausoleum of the Draenei of Draenor, where spirits of their dead could finally find rest. However, this holy sanctum had been influenced by a servant of the Orc Gul'dan, Terran Gore. The warlock not only fed upon the Draenei souls, but bound some to vigilance. Constructs infused with souls of great Draenei warriors to defend the Orchindun, now repurposed to Terran Gore's nefarious ends. Lillian Voss not only wanted heroes to defeat Terran Gore, she also wanted them to find a soul sever blade from necromancers present in the Orchindun. This blade would allow Lillian to hunt down tormented undead, 
and sever their souls from the world. When the hero returned this blade to her, she found it served its purpose perfectly. However, as a soul sever blade was partially woven together by spirit energy, it would eventually break down, that energy being spent when severing souls. This meant Lillian would frequently return to the tavern to request more blades from heroes. When the Burning Legion launched their third invasion of Azeroth, Lillian Voss was among those that would answer the call to defend the world. She joined the rogue order called the Uncrowned. Operating out of the Hall of Shadows located in the sewer of Dalaran, this secret organisation claimed themselves to be the slayers of kings, the downfall of empires, the unseen blades that write the true history of the world. Receiving word that forces of the Burning Legion were plotting an attack on the armies of Legionfall, a coalition between all class orders, from a large cave on the broken shore, the uncrowned would act. Lillian Voss would formulate a plan with a fellow member of the uncrowned, the Bloodsail Buccaneer Pirate, Fleet Admiral Tethers. Rogue heroes met up with Voss and Tethers at Dead Man's Bay in the region of Azuna. The pirates within the area were in possession of gunpowder that had been infused with fell energy. After dealing with the Black Sail pirates and forging some orders so they would not follow, the explosives would be transported to the Broken Shore. In order to gain entry to the cave, the hero needed to ascend the mountain, meeting Lillian at the top. As the hero rappelled down into the cave, Lillian gave them their instructions. When you reach the ground, you'll see a barrel. It's full of the fell-infused gunpowder you acquired. By the way, unless you're looking for a fell blade in the back, you might want to avoid being seen in here. Good. The next step is simple. Just get out of this cave without being seen. The gunpowder will do its job. The hero planted the explosives not a moment too soon, as while they did, they overheard the demon's plans. They sought to open up portals to overwhelm the armies of Legion Fall. But before the summoners could be notified, the mission was a success. Tons of stone falling down upon the demon's heads. Lillian would also discover one of the Legion's more devious tactics. As demon hunters had recently joined the Alliance and Horde, demons in disguise could be easily exposed. This meant the Legion devised another way to spy on their enemies, homunculi. These undead constructs devised by the Legion's dreadlords were so lifelike even Voss struggled to identify them. And since the demon hunter's vision could only expose demons, the homunculi were effective spies. Using her skills of observation, Voss was able to determine that a member of the uncrowned, Teirir, was in fact a homunculi, assassinating him. She was also able to identify other possible homunculi in the capital cities of the Horde. With her help, they were swiftly dealt with. So, there you have it. The lore and background behind Lillian Voss. I really hope you enjoyed. Voss is probably one of my favourite Forsaken, second only to Sylvanas herself, so I hope I did her justice. If you enjoyed the art, I've done my best to credit the artists in the description below. To keep up to date with everything happening on the channel, follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I'll also be streaming on Twitch during the time that's now up on your screen, so come along and join me as I play through WoW as my Death Knight, or just play a bit of casual Hearthstone. Until next time, happy Hearthstoning. <laughs>